Hello and welcome to News Hour on Trust Television. I am Shapiro Suleiman. On the News Hour tonight, notorious bandit leader terrorizing northwestern Nigeria calls for ceasefire as bandits kill 20 people in fresh Kaduna attack. Couple in Ogun State sell baby for 50,000 naira. Kano manufacturers face difficulties as they struggle to continue operations. And in the foreign scene, two adults, two children die in Australia light plane crash. Now the news in detail. Notorious bandit leader Bella Toji has called on political and traditional authorities in Zampara state to consider ceasefire and hostilities from all sides. This is contained in a letter Toji wrote to President Muhammad Buhari, Governor Bella Mutawale and the Emir of Shinkapi. Turgi's peace moves come at the time Nigerian security forces intensified offensive against the bandits, leading to ransacking of some of their locations by air and ground troops. It will be recalled that in the past week, there have been reports of at least attacks on bandits' locations around Turgi's area of operations. On Thursday, an airstrike on bandits loyal to Turgi's ally, Alilu, claimed many lives and injured many others. Around the same time, there were other air and ground operations around Isa and Sabambani local governments of Sokoto State. And in Shinkapi local government of Zampara State, where several bandits were reportedly killed, while many of them played the offensive. Reports also said another air interdiction conducted on Saturday around Gebe in Bafarawa district in Sokoto State claimed the lives of nine women six children and one gunman, while in the wake of the confusion created by the military operation, hostages were said to be fleeing from the bandits' camp to reunite with their families. Some 10 persons from Shinkapi also escaped on Sunday, among others. Now, the Deputy General Editor, Daily Trust, Abdulaziz Abdulaziz, is joining us in the studio uh, to talk about some of these developments. Thank you for joining us, Abdulaziz. Thank you for having me. Right, um, you've heard, you know, uh, about the peace deal, if you like, or the, uh, the plea, you know, by uh, this bandit leader, Tuji, uh, asking the government and other authorities concerned to consider a ceasefire, as he said. Um, what do you make up of this? Well, uh, this is, of course, a reflection of uh, so many things. Well, one is in the... Uh, past few weeks we've seen how uh, some bandits in some a other areas in mm. in uh, the same Zamfara state have come forward mm. to talk to the communities uh, to uh, appeal for peace which was really surprising mm. but of course these were coming um, because as some very informed persons including locals say it because uh, the bandits are now facing a season that is uncomforting to the discomforting to them. That is the dry season mm -hmm. in which they have no hiding place and they fear exactly what is now happening to Choji, that is a uh, military offensive. Because, you know, usually during the rainy season, it's really difficult to move to navigate these places because there are no. Uh, no roads and uh, networks in these uh, these are uh, inaccessible places. But now that the uh, rainy season is coming uh, and the dry season is coming, mm. uh, the places are opening up, and then uh, there were fears that there will be uh, military offensive. Uh, mm. And this is now happening. What uh, we have been hearing in the past three days of uh, or the past week uh, attacks, especially around Sabombeni, Isa, and uh, Shinkapi. And uh, these are like epicenter of a lot of uh, activities, including the horrendous murder of uh, travelers. Uh, some uh, over 20 travelers who were, uh, uh, set, who up were set up place mm. and they, they died. Mm. Uh, so now with this renewed military offensive, it is evident that the bandits mm. uh. are now are feeling the heat. And uh, this, for me, is the most important uh, takeaway, mm. uh, that they are feeling the heat, and they know that uh, perhaps uh, the, mm. the end is nigh, you know, it's here. Okay. Now, now but looking at the neutrality, you know, the, the, 
uh, you know, who Turji is and other, you know, uh, uh, kingpins, uh, you know, the, the bandits and so on. And then also you talked about the climate, I mean, the, the change in terms of the, the, the weather, weather so. uh, and so on. Uh, a lot of Nigerians are, you know, not want to believe in him, you know, looking at what they've done in the past and how they've been engaging the authorities and bragging, you know, that they cannot be subdued and what have you. Do you think they should be believed at this point in time? You're talking about the heat they are receiving. Uh, can they, be, can they be, 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 be trusted, so to speak? Yeah, of course, uh, trust is a major thing. It's, mm. a, it's a problem. There is a deficit in trust. And, and to be honest, mm, actually, that mm. is on both sides. That is uh, looking at what has happened in the past, in the pa in the past, mm. where uh, there were similar moves, and then mm. uh, ceasefire or uh, peace deals, and then they collapsed. Mm. But right now, I can uh, no one can really vouch for these guys because these mm. are very um, erratic people mm. who uh, also, of course, are illiterate. Mm. They are often high on drugs and all that. So it's difficult to say that you can hold them to their words. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also important to look at the scenario, the current scenario, mm -hmm. because actually even prior to the, uh, the, the offensive. new offensives, uh, there have been conversations mm -hmm. for peace deals even from November, okay. where uh, some uh, locals, residents in communities Mm. Who are reaching out to them. Some say with blessings of government. So um, I think, uh, and also there is also fatigue. Mm. These people, uh, in as much as they have guns, they have this, they feel they are inv invincible. Mm. They are also um, battle fatigue, mm. and they are also com confined mm. to a place because of this. Mm. Uh, this hostility. Yeah. They uh, they cannot go to places, they cannot go to markets, they cannot even venture out to some nearby villages. So mm. that in itself is imprisonment. Yeah. And some of them are expressing tiredness mm. from that. And I believe mm. uh, if there is, because the problem is the lack of uh, seriousness and uh, um, coordination mm. and, uh, and uh, doing things properly. Mm. If things are done properly, I believe, especially now that they they are feeling the heat, because mm. initially why they felt th that uh, invincible, mm. it was because most of what was happening was a few ground attacks, and there you can't actually beat them to mm. their natural habitat, mm. so they could engage soldiers, they could ambush and mm. all that. Mm. But <laughs> more, everybody who knows this thing will tell you that one of the the major nightmare for mm. all these bandits is you know, seeing a, a jet aircraft. passing by. Mm. Mm. So that jet, that bombardment, because I mm. was in Zampara mm. uh, early this month, around the 6th and uh, yeah. 6th of the month, and I was, that was around the time when uh, two notorious kingpins with their people mm. were killed in an air uh, Raid, strike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. And a lot of people say, if this can be sustained, mm. these people will come out themselves, and it is happening. Right. Okay. Now, looking at you talked about the bombardments. You know, uh, there has been um, you know sustained raid by by the military, uh, the the the, com the air components. You know, bombarding the enclaves, and then the ground troops also consolidating. And there were also reported cases of collateral damage. We've had a number of people were, were killed, you know, including a woman or so. Uh, so how do you think the military, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the authorities can, can manage this, at least to reduce, you know, the, the, the level of casualty on the side of innocent people? Yeah, you know, um, there's, that's one big problem in this whole battle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just like the Boko Haram insurgency. These people mingle with other innocent people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes a lot of uh, intelligence and reconnaissance effort on the past part of the military to really isolate people mm. who are innocent from people who are the government. Because uh, a lot of hap what is happening is that this government yeah. are come in uh, places just outside villages. And a lot of times, if mm. care is not taken, if you are not careful, mm. um, in trying to target them, you yeah. target these villagers. And 
um, sadly, that is one of the major mm. um, uh, major uh, catalysts mm. for even the the the, uh, and the conflict yeah. because a lot of people um, who whose family are innocently mm. killed because yeah. maybe of course these people are flying. Mm -hmm. uh, they, this is the, where they have been living for generations. So mm. for you to now say, oh, because there are bandits here, you have to vacate this place if you are innocent. Mm. It really doesn't hold, hold water. Mm. And that has led to the killing mm. of a lot of people, including, mm. as you said, women and, and children, including those that were killed yesterday. Yeah, but, but there is also a concern on the part of the security agencies. I mean, they, they raise this concern that some of these locals, you know, um, normally provide a shelter or, I mean, um, a hiding place for some of these bandits and so on. And several attempts, you know, to get them to, uh, to expose them or to, I mean, to allow the military operations, you know, to reach the, the, the real target, but uh, some the sort of shield, shielding them. Didn't you think that is also um, an impediment on the part, I mean, in, in dealing with the situation? Yeah, it is. But as I said, um, these people live in their natural environment. Mm -hmm. That is one. So for mm -hmm. you to, um, and therefore, mm -hmm. it's not for them to leave. Right. And then the part of giving information is a very dicey situation. Mm -hmm. If, and that is to me actually caused by the government, because if the people, if the government cannot guarantee their safety, yeah. nobody is, will go really? and risk his own life and give information about bandits mm -hmm. when the government is not there to protect them. So that is a major problem. It's absence of government that makes a lot of the people in these local communities to actually like uh, uh, somehow be in a... A lot of them live in a tight corner because mm. many of them are even victims of the bandits themselves because mm. they rustle their cattle, they oppress them, they steal from them, but mm. because this is their place. Yeah. And then if you now come and say they should give information to government and they give that information and they, are they, are, they know they are that the sure. government, they, yes. they are not sure of protection, That's right. then it's a very problematic situation. Uh, lastly, before we let you go, uh, looking at you know some of the uh, options or some of the... Um, uh, conditions now put forward by Turji is talking about you know banding I mean banning uh, the vigilante uh, uh, operatives you know allowing them to meet with the local MES and what have you uh, an interface kind of and then uh, and other conditionalities do you think these are things that can be met by the government well I don't think they are asking for too much honestly okay. because one is that one problem which uh, I think the cleric, I was discussing with some colleagues uh, recently about it, the cleric uh, Shogumi mm. get misunderstood because perhaps he doesn't know how to put his words very well. Mm. But the truth is that uh, this Fulani or the herdsmen or whatever, they are as much victims of this ongoing violence as the other communities. But unfortunately, uh, the reporting both at the media level, but also at the government level, and response is largely, unfortunately, one-sided. This is an unpopular thing to say, but that is the truth. It is a very serious, it is a one-sided affair in which um, the atrocities committed by the vigilante, which, you know, in one of the conditions he said was that the government should disband the local vigilante. In, this, in some of these places, especially around in the Sokoto, eastern part of Sokoto right now, the vigilante possess even more deadly weapons than some of the of the bandits because they fabricate some of the, some local guns that are even more deadly than AK-47, and they go about wielding them and killing uh, almost anybody in sight, uh, intercepting people, uh, maybe going to markets or somewhere and killing them. So that atrocity is there. So that's one of the things that he said they should. And then also, secondly, one curious thing from that letter mm -hmm. is that he said they want to sit with traditional leaders and and and, sco and Islamic scholars. Yes, yes. Why? Because, the, as, I, as I said earlier in, in this program, mm -hmm. um, they have suffered a lot of. There, there have been mistrust because mm -hmm. of right. um, lack of unfulfilled. Promises, promises on both sides. Right. So they 
perhaps are fed up with political leaders mm. because a lot of so, have so there is that lack of, of trust yeah, that, that between the two parties. There, and it is on both sides. Thank you very much, Abdelaziz Abdelaziz, uh, Deputy General Editor Daily Trust, for talking to us uh, on uh, the news hour. Now, moving on, um, bandits have killed over 38 persons in three Kaduna villages and destroyed several properties, including vehicles, houses, and farm produce, setting them ablaze. The State Commissioner Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, in a statement on Sunday, identified the attack villages as Gawram Power, Marke, and Rihia, all in the local government area of Kaduna State. According to Arwan, the military and police authorities reported the incident to the state government that 38 people were killed during the attacks, adding that houses, trucks and cars were also burnt along with agricultural produce at various farms. And operatives of the police intelligence response team working with police in Taraba State have arrested 11 kidnapping suspects in Taraba State. Suspects, the force public relations officer, C.P. Prank Mba, stated this on Sunday in a statement. According to the statement, the suspects were arrested for their complicity and role in the recent trend of kidnapping incidents in the state, including the kidnapping of Serbian personnel of the Nigeria Customs Service, kidnapping of a relative of the Emir of Jalingu, and the killing of a police sergeant in Jalingu, amongst others. He said the police team also recovered seven AK-47 rifles, two Beretta pistols, one twenty-one rounds of live ammunition of different caliber, and four magazines, masks, illicit drugs, and other incriminating items during raid of various hideouts of the suspects in the state. And all public and private primary and secondary school and tertiary institutions in Wushishi local government area have been shut down over a planned banditry attack on schools to abduct school children in Zungeru and neighboring communities. The chairman of the council, Njuma Nalango, ordered the closure of the schools. He said the move followed intelligence report by the security agencies that armed bandits in their numbers we are planning to strike in the day at Niger State Polytechnic and Government Girls Day Secondary School, both located in the outskirts of Zungeru town. Nalango explained that the measure is to avoid a repeat of what happened in Tegina, where Islamia pupils were abducted. Still talking security, Governor of Benue State Samuel Otom has expressed concerns over the high number of opens in parts of the state and the internally displaced persons IDP camps, which he blamed on the activities of gunmen. The governor raised a concern on Sunday during the Thanksgiving service in honor of the family of Justice Polycap Kwahara at the Evangelical Church winning all Equa in Makodi. He lamented that the people of the state are left to carry the budding of little children opened by gunmen without any hope of survival. He appealed to Benue people to pick up the challenge by making efforts to support the orphans who had been trapped in the camps without any hope of parental care. And police in Ogun has arrested a father identified as Wanyebu Chieze and his wife, Olu Chieze, for allegedly selling their one-month-old baby to another woman at the rate of 550,000 naira. The Ogun police spokesman Abimbo Laoye Yemi told newsmen on Sunday that the couple were apprehended on Thursday following information received by officers at Ode Remo Divisional Headquarters that the couple who live at Ayebami Street in Lara, Remo, had willingly sold their one month old baby and left their residence. On interrogation, OAMI said the suspects confessed that the Ruth Obajemi, that one Ruth Obajemi directed a yet-to-be-identified buyer to them on December 14, who told them that she is from the Human Rights Office and would help them to foster their child. The woman then gave them the sum of 50,000 naira and they handed over the baby to her despite knowing her. 
Meanwhile, despite not knowing her, meanwhile, the State Commissioner of Police, Larry Bankoli, had directed that the couple be immediately transferred to the anti-human trafficking in child labor unit of the state CIID for further investigation and manhunt for the buyer of the baby. The National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, has arrested a 27-year-old expectant mother, Eze Chioma, for, for possessing 1,442 kilograms of imported skunk in Lagos. The spokesman of the agency, Femi Baba Femi, confirmed this in a statement on Sunday. According to the statement, the agency also apprehended a four men apprehended four men, including 62-year-old Bassett Emmanuel, with 182,000 tablets of tramadol during a raid at the clandestine drug stores in Lagos. He said in similar raids across eight other states, Rivers, Kogi, Benue, Adamawa, Anambra, Edo, Ikiti, and Ondo, over 4,000 kilograms of asserted illicit drugs were seized. Ogun Area 1 Command of the Nigeria Customs Service wants members of the state chapter of the National Youth Council of Nigeria, NYCN, to use their positions to partner with federal government of Nigeria in fighting the menace of smuggling in the country. Customs Area Controller Ogun 1 Command, Dera Nadi, gave the admonition while hosting the state executive members of NYCN on Wednesday on a Katsi visit the command's headquarters in Idiroko border, Nyola Maiwa reports. While addressing the Youth Council, the custom controller, Ogun Area 1 Command, Dera Ndani, specifically pleaded with the youth leaders to leverage on their positions to educate the youth of the state, not only on the menace of smuggling, but also on other cross-border crimes for which Ogun State and the federal government's efforts at actualizing the objectives of growing the nation's economy. There's no war between Ogun youth and the Nigeria Customs Service. However, there is effort by Nigeria Customs Service to carry out government mandate against criminal elements who are using Ogun as base. On our part, the Grand Cotton Service will continue to educate officers and men on the need to ensure compliance with the rules of engagement in the service in dealing with members of Ogun community. We don't want to believe that everybody in Ogun is a small group. With specific reference to claim that smuggling activities is necessitated by the unemployment, Indani asked the youth to take advantage of the ongoing recruitment exercise into the Nigeria Customs Service to better their careers in life, stressing that the service always accorded high priorities to the border communities each time it is recruiting. I wish to remind the great of the youth that the window of employment into Nigeria Customs Service has just been opened. The website is www.custom.gov.ng. Visit that website, click on vacancy, and apply. Comrade Abdul Jaba Ayelegba, the chairman, National Youth Council of Nigeria, Ugu State Chapter, earlier appealed to the leadership of Nigeria Customs in the state to prevail on their operatives to desist from the habit of indiscriminate firing within towns. There are still um, from, from areas that we think the custom leadership uh, needs to address very uh, well. And one of these areas is uh, firing, firing within towns. Ayela Agbe explained that indiscriminate shooting of firearms within towns by NCS and the smuggling operatives has always resulted in deaths of innocent souls, a situation which he said smugglers usually take advantage to escape. There in Inadi also commends the controller general of customs for providing new patrol vehicles for suppressing smuggling in the state. Three weeks ago, we took delivery of 10 numbers of Toyota Hilux vehicles, brand new, fully kitted, with all operational needs in the vehicle, the siren, the amber lights, everything, the navigation. Those vehicles have been fully deployed 
the officers of the command and have been put into good use. Shortly after taking delivery of those vehicles, the command seized over 7,000 bags of rice. That was the equivalent of about 12 trailer loads of rice. Just yesterday again, the command has taken delivery of four number units of Toyota Land Cruiser vehicles, gunboats. As you can see, they are fully equipped. These vehicles are actually instruments of trade facilitation. To the non-discerning mind, they appear like instruments of war, but they are not. They are deployed here for border protection. They are deployed here to protect legitimate trade and combat those who engage in illegitimate trade. I want to be able to take one message back. A secured border in Nigeria will translate to more revenue for the seaports. Also doing here is part of revenue collection for federal government. With the use of these vehicles we are seeing here, we will make sure that those who are smuggling will stop. And when they stop, what it means is that those in the seaport who are collecting revenue will collect more revenue. Eniela Maiwa, Trust TV News, Ugo. We are now joined by Dr. Sanya Aliyu, a security and intelligence expert, who is also the Commandant General, Neighborhood Enlightenment and Safety Organization, NESO. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me this evening. Yes, we've seen, you know, one of the bandits' leader, Belaturji, advancing to the authorities in Nigeria, asking for a ceasefire. And this is coming on the heels of, you know, uh, the position of some northwestern governors, you know, who felt that there shouldn't be any dialogue. Um, again, uh, people like uh, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi were for dialogue because they believe that is the only solution to the problem. Now, what do you think? What is an ideal situation to do at the moment uh, with these advances and offers? Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is no dialogue with a criminal anywhere in the world. These guys are criminal, hardened criminals. They have exterminated a lot of lives, destroyed a lot of families, make, bring hardship to the whole country, make farmers um, uh, uh, impossible to, to farm, uh, brought uh, hunger into in the nation. They have caused us a lot, a lot of pains, and therefore there shouldn't be any space for dialogue, as there is no space for dialogue with any criminal anywhere in the world. They are, they, are, they are to be dealt with. Uh, the way they killed, they are to be killed. If they are arrested, they are to be prosecuted. And of course, we should have corporal punishment back in this country. If you look at uh, during Buhari's time uh, as a military head of state, there used to be cocaine pushers. When we, when we operated that regime of uh, corporal punishment, a lot of people went away from such, such illicit deals. This is drug deals. So I think Nigeria is a sovereign country. Even though we are bounded by other charters, of international charters, mm -hmm. we should know how to fix our own country. Nobody from America or London or anywhere in the world can tell us how to lead or fix our own country. If, our country, if, if, our, if these guys are bad, from other fillers around, you could see that these, these guys have been sponsored. We have some photos yeah, that... I'm actually coming to that, yes, you know, yes. because there are some people believe that there is external influence. There is external influences. So do you believe in that narrative? Of course there is external influences. I think we, we need to call a spade a spade. I was listening to a South African uh, activist the other time. Hmm. He said, why white men are no more much in this country? It's because Nigerians tell them off. We have the capacity to tell you what we want and we have the drive to, to, to drive at what we want. I don't think we, at this age and time, Nigerians should bow down for any white man. Because as far as I'm concerned, we are the black, we are the most populous black nation in the world and we are supposed to be sitting at the drivers on the driver's seat so that other African nations take a cue from us. We are leaders of Africa whether we like it or not. And therefore, we must take that driver's seat. Mm -hmm. And we cannot allow some, some, some miscreants to come and distort or dis disrupt our system. Mm -hmm. The government must fight them. Mm -hmm. we, we are all out to fight them. And we must put a stop to all this nonsense. Yeah, but, but then terrorism, you know, is a global phenomenon. And Nigeria cannot operate in isolation. We're talking about a challenge, you know, that is bedeviling countries, especially the Sahelian uh, states. And so on. And on the other side, we have the, the, the Chad, Lake Chad, you know, basing uh, also being affected by the Boko Haram insurgency. 
President Mahmoud Buhari just came back from Turkey and he was talking to the, uh, the president there and the authorities uh, on the need for them to support Nigeria and other African countries in dealing with this challenge. Did you think international collaboration is also key looking at the dynamism of uh, uh, terrorism? Well, if you look at, if you want to talk about international cooperation or, or partnership or whatever you want to put it, mm. it is essentially very important because uh, terrorism, if you want to look at it from the scope, it is international, it is national, it is uh, uh, cross-border, and it is local. So mm. there must be that cooperation. Mm. And uh, it's not only about... Uh, we, but the issue is that is, is there thoroughness in what we are trying to uh, establish because mm. if we are able to get country A to be involved in disruption of Nigeria or sponsoring of Boko Haram or any other terrorist group, or even whatever you want, name you want to put, give them, okay. we must be able to tell that country to, to, to a standoff. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. Because it is not about uh, the president or the... the the government telling us that we know the people behind this act of terrorism, or the sponsor of this act of terrorism, yeah. but we are not ready to mention them. It doesn't make sense. Mm. Let, we are not asking them to mention them. We are asking them to uh, actually them. arrest them and prosecute them after their thorough investigation. Yeah. yeah, okay, you talked about um, the fact that what Nigeria needs now is, you know, sustained kinetic measure. Uh, you're not for the current, you know, kind of approach uh, or dialogue or whatever. Uh, but uh, we are having, we are seeing the fallout you know, of what is happening. Uh, there is sustained bombardment recently in, in Zamfara and other enclaves of the bandits, and there are also civil, civilian casualties. And how do we, I, I mean, address these issues now? Well, uh, in any such operation, there are most casualties. It is synonymous with such operation anywhere in the world. And that is why. Uh, but when you want to look at it, you look at it from the mm. gain, gain side of it. Now, mm. if you can lose 100 people as uh, collateral damage, mm. and then you save 200 million people, I think it's not, if you look at, if you, if you look at the mm. comparison, it's nothing to talk about. Usually, they, 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 they go behind mm. civilians, they go into, into their, uh, uh, their villages to, to give them some, some sort of cover. And it is difficult for the man that is operating a, a craft upstairs to identify whether this person is civilian, whether this person is a, is a terrorist or, or a bandit. So, I mean, it is normal. It is normal. Absolutely. Collateral damage anywhere in the world is normal. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanya Liu, a security and intelligence expert, and Commandant General Neso, Neighborhood Enlightenment and Safety Organization, for talking to us uh, on the news hour. Thank you. We appreciate it. Now, moving on, you're still watching uh, News Hour on Trust Television, coming up after the break. How shoemaking business sustain family of amputee. Stand by for this and more shortly. Get latest updates on current topical issues and breaking news by downloading the Trust TV mobile app on your Android devices. Go online, click Google Play Store, search Trust TV, install the app and get doses of unfiltered information on happenings all over the world in your pocket. Trust TV, documenting the Nigerian story.
Welcome back. If you're still joining us, this is News Hour on Trust Television. Now, a look at our top stories. Notorious bandit leader Bella Toji has called on political and traditional authorities in Zampara State to consider ceasefire and hostilities from all sides. And police in Ogun has arrested a father identified as Onyebu Chieze and his wife Oluchieze for allegedly selling their one-month-old baby to another woman at the rate of 50,000 naira. Now, still ahead. Bauchi State's primary health care development agency says it has recorded 153 suspected cases of Lassa fever between January and December 2021. Executive Secretary of the agency, Dr. Rulwana Mohammed, told news agency of Nigeria on Sunday in, Abu in Bauchi that the cases were recorded in five local government areas of the state, namely Bauchi, Bogoro, Ganjwa, Kerfi, Tapa, Balewa, and Turu. Mohammed said the state have recorded 21 confirmed cases of the disease, while six suspected cases are currently on admission. According to him, the agency has embarked on contact tracing to curtail the spread of the disease, adding that surveillance teams have been deployed to enhance rapid response across the state. He urged the people to keep a clean environment, good sanitation and personal hygiene to protect themselves against the disease. Sadiq is an eight-year-old boy, full of life, but his story changed when his quest for education left him with both limbs amputated. But despite the setback, he still finds courage to push through life by engaging in shoemaking to fend for himself and his family. Now take a look. My name is Sadiq Mohammed. I was coming back from school. Then I was not looking at the road. Then a trailer and I hit me. This is Moko, a small baggy dominated village in Dusan Al Haji, Abuja, Nigeria. It is a commercial hub for rock breaking, which explains the presence of tipper trucks within the vicinity moving rock fragments. This is the road that led to Sadiq losing his limbs. I was taken to hospital and then they took me sleeping injection. Don't sleep. I stayed home for six months before going back to school. My dad used to work in Paris. Yeah. So anytime they work, they used to pay him 2000 1000 Then he used to drop it and they would pay for our school fees. My name, my name is Raina Mohammed. I'm from Nasarawa State, do my local government. So it's my son, Sadiq Mohammed. It's 2013, December on 6th. Just coming back from school, earlier, primary school, Muko. So, the intent I come, if I break, come match up. The road shall go to the general hospital. So from there, they come on one leg from Kubwa General Hospital in the enter strike. From there, we go PW after Mr. B for Kubwa, Kubwa Federal House. They come on the second leg for private hospital. From there, we come back for Kubwa Hospital. Okay, we did there from December 2014, April, we come back to Mbu. So from there, we start the school. We start the school. Yes. Sometimes people then they help me to buy in basket spoil. People then they help me to buy the basket. So I even carry the matter, go in Belen to help me. I work at tire from there. I come as I know have money to go there again. I spend money tire, I can't stop to go there. Even for the house when we are there. Now 
I go for three years now, I never have money to pay for the hustle. So, now the, my landlord give me quick notes to pay for more for the house. I just beg it to help me this December time. Anything I have it, I'll give to him. With the help of a sister who helps locomote Sadiq, we visited the place where he learns shoemaking. President Mohamed Buhari has returned to Nigeria after participating at the Istanbul Third Turkey Africa Sum Partnership Summit. The president, who clocked 79 years on Friday, received a birthday card by the Chief of Staff Ibrahim Gambari, Administrative Officer Abubakar Mekanu, and other aides shortly on his return from the official visit. While in Turkey, the president had called on the Turkey Africa Partnership Summit to provide concrete support to help defeat terrorism and insurgency on the African continent. And the mayor of Daouna, Alhaji Farouk Omar, on Saturday, tabbed the only son of President Muhammad Buhari, Yusuf Buhari, as Talban Daura and district head of Kwasarawa community. At the occasion, the emir said Buhari deserved to be appointed as a district head, considering the developmental strides brought to the emirate by his father. He added that his new role, he will be, in his new role, he will be visiting Daura regularly and be participating in the daily routines of the Emirate Council, contributing his quota towards its development. The Daura Emirate Council recently appointed President Muhammad Buhari's nephew, Musa Haro, as district head of Buhari's ancestral town of Dumoko. In attendance at Yusuf Buhari's tabernacle include Vice President Yemi Shibanjo, Senate President Ahmed Lawan, and Speaker of the House of Representatives Femi Bajabiamila, Governors of Katsana State, Kanu State, the Emir of Bechi in Kanu State, among others. Now uh, let's join Aisha Salihu for Business News. National Bureau of Statistics shows that manufactured goods valued at 13.7 trillion naira have been imported into Nigeria from January to September this year. According to NBS, the country exported 757 billion naira worth of manufactured goods in the nine-month period, accounting for 0.06% of the total trade of 14.3 trillion naira. The data said the value of trade in the manufacturing sector stood at 4.78 trillion naira in the first quarter of this year, representing 49.01% of the country's total trade in the period. Out of 4.78 trillion naira, exports accounted for 250.4 billion naira, while the import component stood at 4.5 trillion naira. Meanwhile, National Bureau of Statistics says generators powered by petrol, diesel and gas provide 48.6% of the electricity consumed by power users across the country. Latest data by the Bureau on Power Sector Preview presented to the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry this month showed that almost half of the country's electricity supply is from generators. The report further showed that the national grid is providing 51.2% of the country's power needs, indicating that many citizens in Nigeria depend on generators for electricity. 
The NBS document further showed that petrol power generators accounted for the bulk, 22.6%, of the electricity supplied by generators, followed by diesel power generators, 16.6%, while gas power generators accounted for 9.4% of the self generated electricity. The Debt Management Office has clarified that loans from China to Nigeria, which presently stood at $3.59 billion, constitutes only 9.4% of the country's total foreign debt stock of $37.9 billion. The Director General of DMO, Patience Oniha, stated this on Saturday in an interview in Abuja. She also clarified that the loans were likely concessional, as no national asset is tagged as collateral. Nigeria's total debt stock as at September 30 is $37.9 billion, comprises the external debt stock of the federal government, 36 state governments, and the federal capital territory. Lagos Commodities and Futures Exchange says commodities contribute about 70% to Nigeria's gross domestic product. The managing director and chief executive officer of the organization, Akina Keredolu Ale, in a statement stated this, while restating the body's commitment to advocacy as a strategy to create awareness on how the commodities exchange could grow the nation's GDP in 2022. He commended the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Securities and Exchange Commission on their roles in ensuring the uptrend of activities in the Nigerian commodities ecosystem. However, highlighted the need to address the depth of fungible instruments and to put a proper risk management structure in place to activate trading in the ecosystem. In the foreign news, four people, including two children, died on Sunday after a light aircraft crashed into the sea near the coast of Australia's Queensland state. Police said the aircraft, a four-seater Rockwell, crashed off the end of a runway at Redcliffe, about 20 miles 32 kilometers northeast of the main city of Brisbane. Police Inspector Craig White said divers recovered the bodies of two adults, including the 69-year-old male pilot and two children from the upturned wreckage close to the shoreline. Australian Transport Safety Bureau Chief Commissioner Angus Mitchell said his organization is investigating. Still on the foreign scene, Switzerland is restricting public life for those who are unvaccinated. Only people who are vaccinated or recovered from COVID-19 will be able to access restaurants, cultural venues or other indoor events. Private family gatherings should be limited to 10 people. This is to contain the spread of COVID-19 in the country. The report. Stricter measures to contain the spread of the coronavirus will apply throughout Switzerland from Monday, 20 December. Only people who have been vaccinated or have recovered from COVID-19 will be able to go inside restaurants, cultural, sporting and leisure venues and attend indoor events. The move is intended to reduce the risk of unimmunized people from becoming infected as they are also more likely to pass on the virus and become seriously ill. To provide additional protection, masks must also be worn in these settings, and food and drink may only be consumed while seated. In settings where masks cannot be worn, such as place for brass band practice, or where it is not possible to eat or drink while seated, such as bars and discos, admission will be limited to vaccinated or recovered persons who also present a negative test result. People who have been fully vaccinated, received a booster, or recovered from COVID-19 in the last four months, do not have to take a further test. A requirement to work from home has been reintroduced. Private gatherings are limited to 10 people if one person above 16 who is unvaccinated or has not previously had COVID-19 is present. The decision was taken by the Federal Council at a meeting on Friday. And finally, a powerful gas explosion in a sewage system in the southern Pakistan city of Karachi has killed at least 12 people and injured several others. Senior police officer Sarafar Nawaz Sheikh later said two of the injured died in the hospital, raising the death toll to 12. The report. Police and hospital sources said that at least 10 people were killed and 12 others injured in an explosion at the ground floor of a two-story building in Pakistan's southern port city of Karachi on Saturday. 
All victims have been shifted to hospital, and most of the injured are in critical condition after being seriously wounded in the incident. The building partially collapsed in the explosion. The rescue teams have called in heavy machinery to remove the debris in order to find the trapped people. In a statement, the Karachi police said that the explosion was due to leakage of gas in the building where a private bank and several other offices stay inside. Bomb disposal squad has arrived at the site for further investigation. And to sports now, let's join Mirdia Umar for the latest updates. Hello and welcome to the World of Sports. FIFA's controversial project to stage the World Cup every two years instead of the current four-year cycle is back on the table as World Football's governing body holds a virtual global summit with its 211 members' federations on Monday. There will be no vote, but FIFA's president Gianni Infantino said the idea is to find a consensus. Former Arsenal manager Asen Wenger, now FIFA's head of global development, championed the idea of having a major international tournament every year, alternating between a World Cup and different continental championships. Meanwhile, the Confederation of African Football, with its 54 member associations, appears in favour, and last month it gave support to the decision of the FIFA Congress to conduct a visibility study. And now to the African Cup of Nations, where Sierra Leone Football Association has confirmed the authorization of FIFA for the selection of three players in Sierra Leone's squad ahead of the 2021 African Cup of Nations in Cameroon. For their return to Afghan, Sierra Leone will play in Group E with defending champions Algeria, Equatorial Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire. The West African side will play their first game on January 11 against the reigning African champions, the Desert Foxes, in Douala. The newly recruited players include Stephen Kolka, Issa Kalon and Jonathan Mose, who are from Sierra Leone in origin but had played at youth level for countries of their birth. Super Eagles interim coach Austin Oguavon has hinted that five new players will be invited to the team ahead of the 2021 African Cup of Nations. The 56-year-old who took over from Gennett War last Sunday stated in an interview. The interim coach who admitted that the team lacked discipline noted that the Nigerian Football Federation has not picked any camp for the team, however, would meet with the Federation to decide the team's program for the AFCON this week. Meanwhile, Nigeria will begin its campaign with a clash against Egypt on January 11 before further games against Sudan and Guinea-Bissau. The 33rd AFCON is built for January 9 to February 6, 2022 in Cameroon. And still talking Afghan, the 2021 Total Energy's African Cup of Nations preparatory waves have hit Gabon as a total of 30 Panthers have been named in a provisional squad steered by skipper Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Frenchman Patrice Neveu unveiled the squad at a press conference in political capital Libreville on Saturday. Gabon returns to the continental showpiece after missing out on the 2019 edition in Egypt. They will open their Group C campaign against debutant Comoros at the Amadou Ahijo Stadium on January 10. Gabon will then confront four-time champions Ghana before capping off on January 18 against 1976 champions Morocco. And the Central Africans reached the quarterfinals of the 1996 and 2012 Afcon. And away from the shores of Africa to the Premier League where coronavirus hit Chelsea were only able to name four outfit players on the bench for Sunday's match against Wolves after the Premier League rejected their request to postpone the game. Thomas Tarko had to juggle his resources in recent weeks due to injuries and illness and is without Romelu Lukaku, Timo Werner and Callum hudson Odoi for the kickoff after they all tested positive for COVID-19. Taco made two changes from Thursday's 1-1 draw with Everton with Trevor Kaloba and Ungolo Kante starting in defensive midfield. The European champion's request is understood to have been rejected because the Blues were deemed to have had enough players to fulfill the fixture according to Premier League regulations. Meanwhile, Premier League clubs are due to meet on Monday to discuss what action to take over the growing COVID crisis with a busy schedule of matches over the Christmas and New Year period. 
And finally, Jurgen Klopp says Liverpool are having really good conversations with Mohamed Salah over extending his contract. Salah, who has 18 months left on his deal, told Sky Sports in October that he never wants to leave Anfield, but that his future is dependent on the club. Liverpool had tied down a number of senior players to new deals this season, but fans are still waiting for their star forward to put pen to paper on a new contract. Manager Jurgen Klopp said he's not worried about the pace of negotiation. And that is a sports update at this hour. I am Martia Umar. And with that, we have come to the end of the Trust Television News Hour. Don't forget to connect with us across all our social media platforms. I'm Shapiro Suleiman, thanking you for staying with us. Do have <music>